While the 2008 financial crash drives America into recession and unemployment, Williston, a small town in North Dakota, experiences a genuine black gold rush. Thanks to hydraulic fracking techniques, oil is discovered in this tiny town. In fact, it turns out that Williston is sitting atop one of the largest shale oil fields in the nation. Companies rush to exploit this new energy resource buried nearly two miles below the Earth's surface. Oil soon flows freely and news spreads like wildfire. For the ones left behind by the crisis of 2008, Williston seems like their last chance for new life. With an unemployment rate of 0% and wages at three or four times more than the national average, the promise of prosperity in desperate times is too great to ignore. Driven by a common hope, thousands of men and women throw themselves once again into a desperate rush towards the mythical American dream at any cost. History repeats itself in the midst of this new boom, no doubt the most impressive in U.S. history. They need people. There's more work out here than they got people to do it. It's unbelievable. We still believe there's a dream here. I'm gonna use that again. We still believe. It's like a gold rush. It is very, very similar to a gold rush. Palmer is fresh out of Cincinnati. In 2012, after being unemployed for months, he hears about the boom happening in Williston. At first, he works for an oil company, but soon his desire for independence takes over and he sets up his own service company. We bought the company and we had a sweeper truck. And the situation in Williston went from a manageable situation where I, I would get like some sleep at night and I could like keep up with like daily activities like taking showers every day to like an all out sprint trying to like keep up with so much work. It was amazing. Go from one job to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, as it is now. I have not, right now, I have not taken a full day off in over nine months. And I'm very thankful. I'm, very, I'm not complaining one bit. I'm very thankful for the money and opportunity here. It was like someone who had been starving for years for like money to like all of a sudden there's like a all you can eat like buffet and all you have to do is go out there and get the work done and people give you money to do it. It was amazing. This year, I'm probably gonna be making around $250,000. There's a lot of work involved, a lot of work. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, I guess I should get back to work. We are in an inhospitable land full of contrasts. Before the boom, Williston was a small conservative agricultural town and in many ways, this aspect seems untouched. Everything has its own place, including boredom, emptiness, and silence. The streets are practically deserted. It's a town that is motionless within its history and past. Then you have another town, the one that needs to welcome this new wave of residents. Oil companies settling down in large numbers with the goal of extracting at least a million barrels of oil a day. This is the one we unpack like a wrapped gift. Unreal, without soul, growing up with a kind of uniformity. Copy and paste, prefabricated, never custom made. The investors were right and bet everything based upon a population that should be multiplied by four. I first came up here in the spring of 2014. I worked at uh, Neighbors. They did uh, hydraulic fracturing. And I was looking at how much it was going to cost me to stay somewhere, even if I was just going to stay in a hotel. It was like $100 and up. I was adding it up, okay, $100 a day, seven days a week, that's $700 over the course of a whole week. And so I just came to the conclusion, you know what, I'll get me a van, fix it up so that you know I can be comfortable in it. It makes financial sense because I get to keep the majority of my money versus just, just throwing it away on housing and stuff like that. This right here is my trusty van. It works. And that's the biggest thing. Jerry cannot survive very long in his van where winter temperatures sometimes drop below minus 20. 
For the time being, nothing is ready. Everything has happened so quickly, it's very hard to find a place to live. Makeshift housing known as man camps line up by the hundreds on the edge of town or close to drilling sites. These dormitory towns, built by necessity on empty lots, offer rates between $100 and $150 a night, two meals included. By 2012, the population living in these man camps was estimated to be over 10,000. We have guys from Atlanta, Florida, Nevada, Chicago, Cleveland, you name it, I've seen a license plate, you know, everywhere, you know. This is the best thing going for a single man. You know what I mean? That's what I meant as far as wages and, and, and uh, job opportunity and everything, you know? The whole country should be this way. This place will put like a stress on you. It, it'll put a weight that you'll be carrying around on you and, you, and you you won't really realize it. And when I went home and came back, I noticed it. That weight, that that pressure, that that whatever you want to call it, it builds up over time for being up here. You you wouldn't come up here unless there's some reason for you to come up here. You know, nobody was moving up here in two th in, in two thousand. Nobody was moving up here in 2001 or 2002. It wasn't until, okay, I can gain something financially. I can, I can improve my situation. I can better my status, my situation, or, or the level that I'm at in life now. And that's, that's what the oil fill up here really brought to a lot of people who were smart about it and saved their money. Because I'm telling you, man, I, I've seen a lot of folks crash and burn up here. There's not much up here to do to keep you busy, focused on something else, you know, you know, keep your time occupied. You know, it's really allowed me to save up all of my money. And I'm in a position where, you know, I can go back home and buy me a house cash. I, I just like the sound of that dude. I, I, I can go back home and buy me a house, pay cash for a house. Not a car, not a car, but a house. All around Williston, the boom leaves its footprints on the landscape. The vast desert plains are covered for good by these horse heads for as far as the eye can see, swinging slowly to extract the black gold from the subterranean depths. It became urgent to build four-lane highways all around town in order to accommodate the lines of trucks transporting all kinds of pipes, beams, sand and water used in fracking. Nothing was planned in advance. Everything was done in a hurry because of the immediacy of the work and the enormous influx of workers. Investors and the unemployed rushed in, chasing their dream to grab a piece of the pie. I have a German gun, Austrian gun, Italian and American, and my rifles, just in case I need to kill someone. Most Americans have guns in their house. And at the foot of my bed is a Bible. Most of my adult life was spent in universities doing teaching or research. I went to the University of Maine and got several degrees there in agricultural engineering, information systems. Then I worked for MIT on the Human Genome Project. There came a time when there was a recession and the, there was high unemployment. I spent a lot of time reading the news on the internet and I kept reading about the Williston oil boom, the Bakken shale. I wasn't doing anything, I was going into debt. So I decided to go from an area that had almost 10% unemployment to an area that had less than 1% unemployment. I came looking for work, but I didn't know what kind of work to take. So I fell into wireline. It was very difficult at the beginning. I had an accident while pulling a trailer. I could have been killed. There were explosives in the trailer, and it spun 360 degrees, and the explosives came out the back. 
Um, but my boss didn't fire me. They gave me another chance. After the first year, I was very employable. I had a marketable skill. It pleases me that I had a hand, a small hand, but nevertheless, I changed my career late in life and involved myself in American energy independence and in weaning this country off of our foreign oil dependency. You know, America would sell its own mother for energy. I live in uh, St. George, Utah. Uh, my family's down there. I needed to come up here to make some money to pay off debt and stuff. We're getting there. I went to school and became a teach school, elementary school. I could make $25,000 as a teacher, or I could make $50,000 a year in driving truck, so I chose to drive truck. I work usually 12 to 14 hours. Get my truck right around 8 o'clock in the morning and I work till 8 o'clock at night, you know, somewhere between 8 and 10 at night. It's mentally fatiguing. Not only am I physically fatigued, but it's a mental fatigue also. Now this is the moment that I like the best. Reach down, turn off the key, everything stops vibrating, all the noise goes away, and it's the end of the day. I live in uh, company housing here. It's provided uh, by the company. I have to share a, a 35 foot RV trailer with a, a 350 pound guy. <laughs> you got your paperwork done yet? Uh, no, I do not have my paperwork done yet. Got frozen meals in the freezer. Running around trying to find a job and work here or there, that's not a good life. And my children have had some, some problems. So I spent a lot of money helping my children and I've accumulated debt. So the original plan was to come up here for six months and get out of debt. But as I came up, made money, paid off some bills, there were other things. Oh. <laughs> Hi, happy birthday, oh. Celestial. Ah, uh, thank you. Hey, guess what I got for my birthday? Six, six stitches? Yeah, six stitches in my head. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're feeling better, Celestial. Well, honey, so, we love you. I love you, too. And talk to you in the morning. Talk to you tomorrow. All righty. Love you. Happy Everybody birthday. You are where it's at. <laughs> <laughs> I usually park the truck, come back to the trailer here, get a uh, frozen meal, throw it in the microwave, sit down and eat it. And uh, if we're not too tired, uh, my roommate and I will uh, have a bowl of ice cream and, and watch uh, part of a DVD on, on the laptop. <laughs> but most of the time it's eat and go to sleep. I don't take a shower every night because we don't have a shower. Well, there's a shower in the trailer, but there's no running water.
This boom has not solely attracted oil workers. It was an opportunity for people like Jeff and Constance to change their lives and to open a small business. Before I moved to Williston, I was in the healthcare industry. I'd been a hospital administrator for uh, several years in Kansas. My project was gonna go live and I wanted to be with my family first. And I remember talking to some people, was talking about Williston and about North Dakota and the oil boom. There was a lot of oil out here and there's a lot of jobs and there's a lot of opportunity for business. Williston seemed to have the best opportunities for us and my family. And so we drove up, took a look, and we realized immediately there was a huge opportunity out here. So many people out here. There must have been at least 30,000 people going through here and there were only five restaurants at the time. And then we looked a little bit closer and said, okay, what skill sets do we have that would be a good fit for this? And we thought that maybe, maybe a donut shop would work. So many other businesses have done here and the old timers, they all think that foreigners come in here to take their money and then go back home. They don't think we're like that. And I think that's one of the big reasons we've been successful. It's not just a business for us. We are part of the community. If we were embraced by the community, they supported us. They definitely did. They helped us out. Um, we are part of it and we've always contributed. It's going to be a good day today. A lot of kids are going to be really excited to have donuts. When we came here, they didn't have a donut shop. They hadn't had one for over eight years. And most of these kids had never had a real fresh donut before. And they come into my shop all the time. Go, go donuts, wow, go, go donuts. There are more families that are coming into Williston. Now I go pick up Kaylin at school and I see other kids, you know, other Asian kids, African, uh, Hispanic, you know. It's a good sign that the community is growing in a healthy way. Craig lives in Bozeman, Montana, a small town 600 miles away. He has run out of options in his hometown and has decided to set out for Williston. He knows he will not see his wife and two kids for several weeks. Eight long hours behind the wheel with the hope that he will find work when he arrives. When I leave my family like this, I usually feel you know, pretty lousy at times. Um, there was one incident years ago where my daughter was just in tears as I was leaving and it's like, ah, it's hard. It's, it's not fun, it's hard, but it's what has to be done. They're getting better at it. They're getting used to it. Um, I'm getting used to it, but I still don't like it. I'd rather be home. Hey, how's it going? Craig has been away. He's usually gone. He could be anywhere from about four weeks to hmm. this last time was eight weeks. Really? We didn't see him for about eight weeks. And then he'll come home for about a week or so. I think it's been the hardest for the kids because They've told me that they feel like it's a broken home. You know, it's, it's almost like we're divorced because we see so little of each other. So it's just been really hard for them. This is very similar to living on a ship or being on a, a boat. You're gone for months at sea. You come back and you see the family for a short period of time and then take off on your ship again. You're, it, it's a great analogy. It's exactly what it's like, so. We've all talked about this, and I think we could do with a little less so that he could spend more time with us and be more mm -hmm. of a family. So I think I would rather have that happy family <laughs> over yeah. some of the stuff that, we, that he tries to provide for us. Not watching my kids grow up, uh, it's difficult. I've been doing this almost five years now. There's no doubt about it, but it's just, it's what we have to do. Adam had just lost his job in the oil business when he met Jeff and Constance. The couple was charmed by the courage and willpower of this young man ready to do anything to save his family from misery. 
Since then, Adam spends all his nights kneading donuts. I'm doing three jobs right now, working every day, you know, so trying to get some money. I want to relocate my family up here. I got two girls, two daughters, and um, I want something better for them. Where we live in Southern California is not a very nice place to live, you know, so it's a lot of crime and a lot of gangsters and stuff around. So I think North Dakota would be a better place to raise a family. There's a lot of resources here and they got the Salvation Army and they feed you here at the Methodist Church and over at uh, Lutheran Church down there. And I get uh, food from work too, uh, at the donuts, I'm trying to send all my money home for my wife to pay the bills and rent. It's enough to get by and I just pay the rent. You know, I only pay a hundred a week right now. The guy, he's, he understands I have a family. He, he, he wanted to say 125, but he's, he dropped it down to 100 a week. The American dream is something you can always chase. I really believe that. Even during the recession, there were still opportunities around. You just got to look for them. You got to be able, willing to move, to change, to, to get going and go, go chase it, go do it. Now, a lot of people won't do that, but the ones that do will usually come out ahead in the long run. Because our country never is stable across the whole board. It's, it's very rare to have all 50 states doing well. It's also rare to have all 50 states doing poorly. So we're always moving around. That's part of our national character, to always find new opportunities, wherever they may be. What I do here pretty much is remodeling homes, and handyman work fixing uh, other people's mistakes, other people's problems, mostly for homeowners, uh, residential. It keeps me real busy. I bill out usually about 60 hours a week. I can easily put in a 12 hour day, no problem, because you have to run, you know, might go to the bank, post office, go see clients, check on supplies, order stuff. A lot of running around to do. I love to work. I'm, I am a workaholic, there's no doubt about it. The money's nice, but I, I like to work. It's just the way my family is. These are some of the old cattle pens and corrals here. Some of them have fallen apart completely. But this is where they bring in the cattle to brand them, have the calves, uh, have the vets work on them and stuff. But you know, like you can see, they don't use it anymore. That was kind of a tough life. I mean, you lose cattle, they die, and, and the winters and so on, the hot summers, and you, you know, drought. You just don't know what's gonna happen. It's a gamble every year. They never made a lot of money doing that, most of the ranchers and farmers. But they really don't have to do that anymore because they've got the pumps down there that they can make money off of, and the oil has put a lot, a lot of money into their pockets. So now they can do what they want. You know, take it easy, work, whatever they want to do. So it's not as risky. Life's not as risky as it used to be. You don't meet many people that are from here. When I'm talking to a bunch of people I don't know, and they say, where are you from? I say, here. And they go, what? Most of the people that lived here then, they were just made to see this many people coming. A lot of people made a lot of money, so I mean, they liked it. Uh, the older folks that lived here on a fixed income, renting an apartment, they went from 300 a month to 2,000 a month in rent. So they're gone. I remember the first time I drove out to the place, and it's 18 miles about, and I counted 50 oil rigs that I could see from the road. And that's when it started getting crazy, I thought. You know, the oil companies, for the most part, they're good, and, until they start thinking that they can plow right over you because they're big and powerful. Uh, one thing they do do, and I asked them when they came out the first time, 
They always send a woman along with the initial group that comes out. And I asked him straight out, I said, is that because we won't shoot a woman? And he said, yeah. <laughs> We never locked the house. Now I gotta take the key out all the time of my pickup. We locked the house. We have an alarm system in the house. It changes just about everything. I'm gonna get my mail. Now we're getting more and more neighbors. It's not in the country anymore like it used to be. A lot of these are people that have moved in with the oil. There was no place to buy in town. They bought lots out here, probably three, four acres lots and built out here. Well, this is the pad on our land. Five years ago, it was all grass, like that over there. Now we have this, this pumper going day in, day out. We didn't have any choice, really. We could have put it over that way a ways. I mean, we could have moved it a little bit, but we have to let the people that own the mineral rights get to those mineral rights. And they compensated us for, for what they took here, but the company built it, and we have it now for, oh, next 40 years, I'm guessing. I don't know. My house up there, from there we have, uh, we used to have a beautiful view. Uh, now we have this to look at. Brings in a little bit of money, very little. If they took this out of here, I'd give them back all the money I've made off of it, so. But it ain't going to happen. Someday, you know, when the oil is all pumped out of the ground, they will come back here and, and level it out and turn it back into farmland. But that's, you know, like I say, that's going to be out of most of our lifetimes. It'll be out of mine for sure. You have nothing to say about where? Uh, well, I shouldn't say you have nothing to say. You, you can suggest but they don't have to listen to you. You don't, I mean, you have no legal say in it, put it that way. So yeah, they can put it wherever they want. They don't need any of your permission. If our oil industry follows the proper practices, I, I don't think we'll have a problem, but there's always that if, and if they don't, then we could have an issue. And, and the, the biggest issue would be to, to groundwater, as I see. And when we live out here in the rural areas, most of us depend on, uh, wells for our our drinking water and all the water we use in our homes so if, if that would happen it would be a, a very bad thing hydraulic fracturing job that's where they pump the sand the fluid and the other chemicals because they use acid as one they use a chemical called bio bio it, it kills all biological elements so so when they pump out that off into the ground, any kind of bacteria is going to kill it. Any kind of living organism of any kind, it kills it. Because uh, one of our guys, he got it. He got some of it on his hand, and like, and like the stuff just swole his hand up real, real bad. Because that's what bio does. Bio, bio kills biological anything. I'm pretty sure it, it's it's ruining the water. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it is. It's just like nobody drinks the water out of the, out, out of the tap faucet from North Dakota. I think everybody drinks a bottle of water. You know, just it, it's just like if you ever uh, drunk water out of the out of the faucet, like it's it's nasty. It's it's pretty nasty. When we're fracking, 
no oil or grease is allowed to be spilled on the ground. If you make an, a mistake and you drop one cup, you have to clean it up and take it away with you. It's not polluting North Dakota. The air is clean, the water is clean. This is privately owned land, this is not government land. And unless the Environmental Protection Agency finds scientific proof that there is real pollution going on, they won't be able to shut this down. Um, and so far, there is no proof. There is just uh, uh, propaganda. Is it possible to respect safety measures while fracking? Dan Hagopin is advocating this notion in an attempt to avoid all risk of polluting groundwater. It seems that success is very unlikely. Regardless, the question is being raised and brought to the attention of anti-fracking groups. One thing is certain, the practice of hydraulic fracking demands large quantities of drinking water. Ken Young is the owner of Eclipse Services, a company that facilitates the shipping of water for fracking through pipelines and provides water storage in its huge tanks as well. These tanks are used to hold water for the fracking. They hold 35,000 barrels, and so they'll pump water from one to the other until eventually it's pumped over to the frack and down the hole. Uh, it's fresh water. All that, the water that's running in here is coming out of the city water line. So it's all clean water. You know, they'll spend millions of dollars on water for one frack. It's one of the biggest expenses on one of these wells is the frack. Well, the water after the frack, they just flow it back out of the ground and they haul it off to a disposal facility. Right here, this is called a flare. Natural gas comes up with the oil, and so they have to get rid of it. So they just burn it off right here. Oil comes out of the pump jacks, goes underground to the treaters, and there it separates the oil, the water, and the gas. This site here produces more water than what they can pipeline out of here. So I have to come in with a truck and truck it out and take it to a disposal facility. Keith Bear lives 60 miles out of Williston on Fort Berthold Reservation, where black gold flows freely and accounts for one quarter of North Dakota's production. This oil field isn't all that good for everybody. We have sacred land here. We have virgin land here. And now there's oil roads and oil spills. Uh, at nighttime, some of these trucks, they drive along the gravel roads and they dump poison uh, fracking water and salt water and all these things into the ditch because they're too lazy to drive to the dump station. And that is going into our river, it's going into our creeks, it's going into our stock ponds. They say it's not in the water, but it is. You know, they're not telling the truth. I have 29 grandchildren. I want them to enjoy this river the way I did. I want them to walk in this water. I want them to catch a fish that they can eat. You know, I want them to grow a garden that, that they won't have to worry about poisoning the plant. I want them to have plants with that are, is medicine that's not deformed now because of the things that are in this water. Oil workers are best suited to judge the eventual pollution risks caused by fracking. Unfortunately, this problem is not a priority. They are in survival mode. First and foremost, they are in need of work. During the drilling phase, radioactive debris brought back to the surface is a major risk for workers and the environment. Some companies clearly are not concerned and do not hesitate to dispose of these toxic materials into wild dumps. Specialty teams are left to ship them back to suitable treatment sites. In North Dakota, no one with an oil-rich piece of land will tell you that fracking could be an environmental hazard. Doing so could jeopardize one of the best ways to get rich quick. Of course, all beautiful stories have an end. Right around Christmas 2014, all signs turned red thanks to Saudi Arabia. 
The staggering fall of the price per barrel of oil will put an end to the moment of euphoria that saw the U.S. rise among the first producers of crude oil, thanks to shale oil. We can feel the concern brought by the price cut everywhere, and Williston now shows the signs of a boomtown going bust. People in this town are very, very suspicious of oil booms because it almost always comes with a large bust, and the bust can be rather difficult. And now that I'm a part of this town, I'm a little bit worried because we're seeing gas prices start to drop down, and I'm wondering what's going to happen uh, to my business because we have a lot invested here. January 2015, the price per barrel fell below the crucial $50 mark. And this little town here, Williston, is a major, major reason why the price of oil around the world is coming down because the OPEC countries, Saudi Arabia leading them, they're, uh, they're, they're very scared by uh, the uh, uh, developments in hydraulic fracturing. They know that the United States in the past five years went from importing something like 60% of uh, the oil that we use down to 30%. And that is a direct result of the hydraulic fracturing that's taken place like here in, in Williston, in the Bakken, and in, in other areas. They want to put these companies out of business. Even if circumstances are worrisome these days, activity has not stopped. After digging 10,000 wells, we still need to extract the millions of barrels lying beneath the Bakken. This situation brings happiness to the ones working for service companies, but it is devastating to the oil workers who are no longer needed. They are thrown out into the streets without pity. They must decide whether to go back home or stay in Williston looking for new jobs. In February of 2015, one of, one of my coworkers I worked with, he called me and he said, man, they just laid everybody off. He, he said they told everybody to go to their room, get all their stuff, and get out. And this was 2 o'clock in the morning, at night, in February, in the winter. Man camps emptied out and closed from one day to the next. These dilapidated barracks will probably pollute the landscape for years to come. Construction sites were abandoned by the dozen and left to rust and decay. Housing construction begun at the peak of the Williston boom is now nearly complete. Occupied in part by survivors of the boom, the neighborhood seems sadly empty. Even with the downturn in the economy, the oil prices, uh, I can still make more money than I can back home. Uh, it just not as much as I used to. I, I consider myself fortunate because I still have a job. I was talking to a friend just yesterday and he got laid off. So he's got to go back to Louisiana to find, uh, find work because there are not too many people hiring up here right now. It's hard. Uh, but I'm, I'm making good money and I'm paying bills off and I'm able to help my children out. And that, my children are very important. Just something that has to be done. You know, it's it's just like this job too. You know, two nights ago I wanted to go home. I was tired, but there was high tanks. We 
we had to haul the water otherwise the the well shut down and and people get upset so you do what you have to do Not in the oil. The donuts have slowed down a little bit, but still steady. And um, you know, I'm doing just well. I'm doing three jobs where every day of the week. Let's see. At the donut shop, it's uh, I work about six to eight hours, and then um, in the day for the uh, the guy doing construction, maybe five or six hours. Unless uh, he's not working, I'll do three or four, uh, making the sandwiches in the day. I rent this place to Adam for only $350 a month. He has the whole downstairs to himself, which is a little bit messy. I, I cleaned it up. <laughs> <laughs> he had to leave California because there's no jobs. Why is there no jobs? There's too many Mexicans. The Mexicans will do the same job I was doing for half of the price. Half, you know. How many donuts? Oh. Well, I did 65 pounds. Wow. I've done more before, but that's some big orders. Yeah. 24 dozen pre-order. I've been encouraging Adam to save some money so that he can uh, move his family here and put a deposit first and last month's rent on an apartment. He's a good father, he misses his little girl. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, miss him a lot. I went down and saw him on Christmas. When oil reached $29 a barrel, we weren't doing anything. March was a bad month. But now it's suddenly picked up to $40 a barrel and we're busy again. The companies have done so much cost cutting and efficiency that if the price goes to 50, it will be like it used to be 80. The rig counts, the number of <laughs> rigs drilling new holes in the ground has gone way down from over 200 to I think 35 rigs active in the Bakken. As time goes on without new wells being drilled and fracked, our 1.1 million barrels a day will go down naturally, slowly. In some point in the two to five years, there will be a supply and demand reversal. Whereas now we're oversupplied, we will be undersupplied, and the price will shoot up. Between now and then, it'll go like this. And at some point, it'll go up. And if the price go, ever goes to 100, and it will someday, North Dakota will be crawling with workers, looking for housing, and uh, there will be a huge labor shortage. The companies will be throwing money at us. Now we're mostly working for folks who have oil rigs, oil pumps on their land, and they have those monthly checks coming in from the oil companies, and they're spending money on their homes. A lot of people have disappeared out of here. Gone back home, I guess. I know some have gone back to the uh, Bozeman Big Sky area because construction's doing okay there. Some went back to Minneapolis, some to Idaho, but yeah, a lot of people have left here. I don't know too many people here anymore. They're all gone. It's just slowed down too much. They lost their jobs, got laid off. So couldn't put in the hours. A lot of families too. A lot of guys in the oil business, the higher ups, the guys making more money, they've gone to South America and the Middle East. So they'll be back, I guess, someday, but.
So that's the uh, general process, sort of for cleaning the, uh, the dirt out of the hopper. I could buy a house. I could, I could stay in a very nice apartment, but I don't want that. I don't need it. And I have very low overhead, and I like it that way. I, uh, I don't have a lot of needs. Now this is, uh, uh, it's used, this was a barn, a garage, and uh, there was a, a snowstorm, a heavy snowstorm about three years ago, I suppose, and the snow load on the roof caused the roof to collapse. So uh, anyway, it's uh, kind of an open air garage, and uh, I uh, have a hose hooked up in there, and I wash off under it. The oil industry has changed dramatically, and I don't like to see that. I see companies going out of business and people being fired and laid off and loading up uh, U-Haul trailers and heading out of town, and it's sad. Um, it hasn't really affected me because um, we service the infrastructure that has been built, and once that infrastructure is built, it still needs to be maintained. I'm very thankful for that set up a chair up here for you guys. So tonight we'll have fondue. minute rush but it's nice to have the company I actually enjoy it as I said before I've you're really outside of a former girlfriend that came over a couple of times uh, you're like the only visitors that I've had here um, in the over four years that I've been in Williston I used to be far 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 too interested in girls and that, like politics, I've come to realize, well, politics is a scam. Girls are just problems. So I stay away from both of them now. gas station over here we used to deliver to them uh, three four dozen donuts uh, last week they quit the order altogether because nobody was coming in to buy donuts so there goes one more so we skip this one and keep on going around the corner Your morning going. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> no feeling. Hey, thanks. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Cindy, the owner of the, or the manager of the store there, her business is down so far that she's had to take on a second job now. So she sells cosmetics to women here in the oil field. We gave up a lot to come up here, but we thought it was gonna be best for our family. We thought that the oil boom would be here for at least another 15 years, and that we would be able to be able to make enough money to pay for our kids to go to college. The American dream is changing. That's not what it used to be, and it's a tough reality to deal with.
They say the boom will come back, but if it does, it'll be much, much more shallow uh, growth curve and it won't be nearly as much money in it. I don't know. I'm an eternal optimist. I think it's gonna come back.